Hello everyone, my name is Space Dirt, and this is the third episode of How to Make a Language. Last time, we finalized our two example phonologies and took a little look at some different phonological processes. So now in this episode, it's time to move on to the next big step in conlinging, grammar. Grammar can be a very daunting thing, especially if you're just starting out. But on the flip side, I find that it can be where you give your language a huge part of its identity and really start to see it take shape. Today, I'll just be giving a little introduction to some morphosyntactic concepts while making some goals and profiles for language A and B along the way. First things first though, what is morphosyntax and what does it have to do with grammar? Well, morphosyntax basically is what most people would call grammar. It refers to the combination of morphology which studies the internal construction of words, and syntax, which refers to how these words are organized to form larger units like sentences. This combination is what one may conventionally call grammar, though grammar sometimes encompasses other fields, so just to be extra clear, I'll be sticking to morphosyntax for the most part. Getting on to goals, it can be kind of difficult to just make morphosyntactic goals right out of the gate, especially if the concepts are unfamiliar. So for the purposes of this series, We'll go concept by concept, making goals along the way and coming out with full, basic morphosyntactic profiles for language A and language B. Let's start with something simple, basic word order. If we take a basic sentence like the man pets the dog, we can divide it into three basic components, the subject or the doer of the action, the verb or the action itself, and the object or the receiver of the action. Here, we can see that English follows a subject-verb-object word order, or SVO, which happens to be one of the most common word orders. Even though all possible orders of subject, object, and verb do occur, some are much, much rarer than others, with the three most popular being SOV, SVO, and VSO. Another thing to note is that not all languages are super strict with their word order. Many languages allow for variation, and some languages don't have a fixed word order at all. This doesn't mean that words are just thrown out randomly, though, and word order is chosen by the speaker to emphasize certain aspects of the sentence. In these languages, with more variation in word order, there also tends to be other markers in place so that it's clearer who is doing what to whom. For our example languages, let's choose two more common word orders. I'll make language A VSO and language B SOV. This choice in basic word order can also inform us a bit about other parts of syntax. To understand this though, let's go over what are called phrases. In syntax, a phrase is a word or grouping of words that work together as a single syntactic unit. For example, a verb phrase, at a basic level, consists of a verb and its object. Noun phrase would be a noun and whatever else you may add onto it, like a determiner. An adpositional phrase consists of a noun phrase and an adposition, etc, etc. We can divide these phrases into heads, which are basically the words which determine what type of phrase we're dealing with, and dependents, which modify the head. But why does this even matter? Well, languages often tend towards putting the head either at the front of the phrase or at the end of the phrase. These two orderings are called head initial and head final, respectively. Some languages favor one type of syntax much more than the other, though head directionality is a spectrum and many languages employ both head initial and head final structures in different types of phrases and tend to be more of a mix. Now, with the word orders we have, we can see that language A is head initial in verb phrases, and language B is head final in verb phrases. Based on this, we could have both diverge a little bit and not be so strict in head directionality, but for the purposes of this series, I'll use this basic word order as a guide for the syntax of our other phrases. So for now, we'll have language A follow head initial syntax for the most part, and language B follow head final syntax for the most part. How exactly this manifests in both of them, we will get to in later parts of this series. Now that we've covered our basic syntactic goals, let's get on to morphological goals. One important thing to consider when making a conling is how much information you want to pack in a word. That is, how synthetic is it? This, just like the other concepts we've covered, can be thought of as a spectrum. At one end, we have analytic languages. These are characterized by a relatively small amount of inflection, which is the process in which words are changed to convey some sort of grammatical information, like changing the tense of a verb. Instead, 
analytic languages rely more on things like word order and helping words like particles or adpositions to convey these same concepts. English is actually a relatively good example of this end of the spectrum. The extreme version of analytic languages are called isolating languages, and they have no inflectional morphology at all. Examples of these include languages like Mandarin or Yoruba. On the other side of the spectrum, we have synthetic languages. In contrast to more analytic languages, synthetic languages typically use inflection to show grammatical relationships and concepts, and the more synthetic a language is, the more inflection it can cram into one word. These can be split up into two subcategories, agglutinative and fusional. Agglutinative languages are characterized by how they sort of glue morpheme after morpheme onto a stem, with each one corresponding to a different grammatical category, like plurality or case. Turkish is a prime example of this type of synthesis. On the other hand, fusional languages, as the name implies, fuse these concepts together into single morphemes that convey a whole bunch of different things. An example would be the Portuguese verb comi, which means I ate. Here, the E ending signifies first-person singular, past tense, perfective aspect, and indicative mood. All that in one tiny little morpheme. And don't worry, we will get into all of these concepts in time, but that is for another video. The main point is that in fusional languages, you can pack a lot of info into a very small space. If you go even more extreme towards the synthetic end of the spectrum, you get what are called polysynthetic languages. In these cases, you can get a huge amount of morphemes per word and express in a single word what more analytic languages like English would need many words for. Now that we've gone over a bit of the synthesis spectrum, let's decide where we want our languages to fit in. I don't think I'll go for anything too extreme here, so let's make both more in the middle of the spectrum, making language A a little bit more synthetic, and language B a little more analytic, while also making their synthetic morphological constructions agglutinative. Now that we know that both languages are going to have at least some sort of inflection, the next question is where do we want to put it? Going back to our discussion of heads and dependents, many languages prefer to mark one over the other in general. In head marking languages, affixes are placed on the heads of phrases. This can take the form of verbal agreement with the subject and object, or possessive affixes on a possessed noun to signify the possessor, among other things. This type of marking is pervasive in many indigenous American languages, like classical Nahuatl. Dependent marking languages instead place marking on dependents. This surfaces is something called grammatical case, where nouns are marked to signify a variety of different grammatical functions. A good example of a strongly dependent marking language would be something like Japanese. Sometimes, languages also use double-marked constructions, where both the head and dependent are marked, though it is quite rare for it to occur super pervasively, but it does happen more often in specific constructions. Alternatively, some languages do what's called zero marking, where neither the head nor the dependent receive any marking. As with everything we've covered, all of these occur on a sort of spectrum, and many languages mix and match these types of marking depending on the construction. We'll go deeper into head and dependent marking and how it surfaces in later videos, but just for goal purposes we can say that language A should lean towards head marking, and language B towards dependent marking. As the final morphosyntactic goal, let's tackle morphosyntactic alignment. This is a particularly tricky topic, and one that personally took me ages to understand. Starting with the basics, let's take a look back at that basic sentence we used to demonstrate word order. Crucially, we used a verb that makes sense to have an object, in this case, pets. If we instead chose a verb like sleep, we just wouldn't be able to add an object. You can't sleep something. You just simply say, the man sleeps. This quality of a verb being or not being able to take an object is called transitivity. Intransitive verbs, like sleep, can't take an object, while transitive verbs, like pet, can. Each of these nouns here, or arguments, has a special name. In the man pets the dog, the man is what's called the agent, or doer of the action to something else while the dog is the patient, or the undergoer of the action. In The Man Sleeps, the man is what's called, confusingly, the subject, but this is distinct from the subject we've talked about earlier. Here, it just refers to the sole argument of an intransitive verb. 
So, all of these things are different, but to speakers of English, we would say that the man, in both sentences, fills the same role, the subject, while the dog is different, it's an object. This is what's called nominative accusative alignment, and it is what most languages do. The subject of an intransitive verb is seen as the same thing as the agent of a transitive verb, and this is conveyed through various mechanisms like word order as in English or other types of marking. However, the opposite can also occur. In some languages, the subject of an intransitive verb is viewed as the same thing as the patient of a transitive verb. In English, this can be approximated with something like I sleep for an intransitive construction, but then me saw he for a transitive one. This is called ergative absolutive alignment, and it occurs in some form in about a quarter of the world's languages. One crucial thing about this alignment is that no known language is fully ergative. That is, there is some element that appears as nominative accusative in some environments. This could be marking depending on tense or person, or it could be syntactic or some other thing. Some languages flip between the two systems very pervasively based on semantic criteria. For example, in Lakota, there are active intransitive verbs, which involve the subject being an active participant in the action. These take one set of prefixes that match up with the agent prefixes of transitive verbs. Then, there are stative intransitive verbs, which don't involve such active involvement and take another set that match up with patient prefixes. This is what's called active stative alignment. In most active languages, whether the subject will be treated as agent-like or patient-like depends upon the verb, but in some languages, the subject can be treated as both an agent or a patient, with the choice changing the meaning slightly, like if the action was voluntary or not. The former type is called split S, while the latter is called fluid S. And crucially, the scope to which the fluidity occurs is usually confined to only a small set of verbs. There are other, even rarer, alignments as well. In some languages, the agent and patient are treated the same while the subject is treated differently, and in others, all three are treated differently. There are even other, more complicated systems, an explanation of which I could not possibly fit in this video. A full exploration of morphosyntactic alignment is far beyond the scope of this video, but hopefully that served as a decent introduction to the concept. As for our two examples here, I'd normally just give them both nominative-accusative alignment for the sake of simplicity, but to demonstrate how some non-nominative marking works, I'll make language A an active language of the split S subtype. And with that, we've made all of our goals and have some morphosyntactic profiles. Now, with that basic framework down, the next step is to figure out how these characteristics we've chosen will manifest. In the next episode, we'll take a deep dive into nouns and nominal morphology and explore all the wonderful things they can express. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and this is Spacedirt, signing off.